Thank you for joining us. My name is Theron Steinke and I am honored to introduce you to our team of clinical educators and local prosthetists and orthotists. It is our firm belief that patients living with limb loss receive the best outcome possible when we take the team approach to their care. The relationship between the prosthetist, therapist, physician, and other treating medical professionals starts and ends with open communication and education. We learn just as much from you as we hope that you learn from us. And it is our goal to make these presentations a conversation, not a lecture. We sincerely thank you for your support and devotion to this specialized patient population. Hi, my name is Brooke Osteen and I'm an occupational therapist. I work for an orthotics and prosthetics company in the Midwest presenting education to both practicing therapist students as well as consulting with our practitioners for patients with both lower and upper extremity amputations. I have worked in a variety of facets in the industry, working for two years in acute care in hands, six years as the lead OT in the burn center, one year in medical sales selling dynamic splints, and most recently eight years for SRT prosthetics and orthotics as the OT on the upper extremity team. My passion is, is helping as many people with amputations as possible through the training of therapists in all treatment settings. I want those therapists who may only see a few amputees a year to be just as comfortable as those therapists who see many amputees each year. I also want to encourage interdisciplinary care with our PTs and our PTAs so that we can achieve the best functional outcomes for our amputee patients. Hey there, today we're going to talk about the difference between a myoelectric and body powered prosthetic device. For your reference, we are just going to talk about a unilateral transradial or below elbow patient. We'll save transhumeral for another day. First, we need to talk about history. So how these devices developed is so important to how they function today. So the first, the first documentation of a body powered device dates all the way back to the Punic War. There was actually a Roman general who lost his right hand and it was, his prosthesis was made out of the same ironclad material that his armor was. Why? So he could hold a sword and a shield and be on a horse all at the same time. Speaking of wars, it was the war of 1812 that we started to see the body powered style device come to have some of the characteristics that are still present today. So you're probably thinking, why does she have a picture of a bike on the screen? I get you, I'll explain, right? So a body powered style device has to have a body and a harness, somewhat similar kind of like to a bike frame, right? Then a couple of the other things cross over as well, right? You have to have some sort of movement. So hands on the handbrake, humeral flexion, get there more specifically in just a second. You then have cable travel and then you have the reaction, okay, of the brakes pushing on the rim of the bike to stop the bike. Same thing with a body power device. You have that, you have a movement, you have cable travel, and then you have the reaction of the terminal device opening and closing. Continuing to talk about war, right? We need to talk about advancements. So what has happened and what we still see today is that anytime there's a war, you see technology advance, right? We see it more today than we ever have before. And the most we've ever seen as far as research and development and technology coming out of a war is Operation Iraqi Freedom. And why is that? Because we had a younger soldier, we had multiple limb loss through IEDs, and we had a huge previous functional history that we have to keep up with. So all the way back in 1812, and even you see in World War II and World War I, anytime there was a war, we saw advancements. So we saw maybe a change in material, we saw a change in weight of devices, which led us to an increase in function. And that still holds true today. So how do these devices work, okay? So much like I alluded to a bike frame, they have to have a harness, 
all right? Something that goes around the patient's body because these are manually operated. So whether it be a chest, a shoulder, or an elbow, there's some sort of gross body movement that's gonna operate this mechanical style of device. So there are two different styles of devices that a patient may use to operate their transradial body power device. The first being a figure eight device and the second being a figure nine style device, okay? So as a therapist, right, let's talk about the things that matter the most to us, right? It's how the heck does the patient get these on, right? So there's two different methods. So I'm gonna show you two different videos in a row. Both are gonna show you what's called the coat method, okay? The first is a figure nine. So the way the patients are gonna don these style devices isn't really that much different than the neuro ed techniques that we were taught in school, right? You dress the bad arm first and you undress it last. So this first figure nine video is gonna be a little bit tricky in that you don't see the patient put the prosthesis on and you're gonna see him put the harness on first. But I did wanna preface that they should don their prosthesis first and then the harness the second. So what makes it the sweater method, right? So when the patient dons the prosthesis first and the harness second, their arm goes into the prosthesis, the harness goes behind the patient, and they push their arm through the axilla loop, much like they would a coat. Hence, it's called the coat method. So you see that with a figure nine, and then you'll see it here with a figure eight. So you'll see Jack take his device off first, and then you'll see me reference, he puts his arm through his prosthesis first, swings the harness behind him, sticks his arm through, much like he would be putting on a coat. Again, that is called the coat method. Here you will see Kendall demonstrate the sweater method. So he dons his prosthesis, his harness is put through the axle loop in front of them, and then it goes up and over his head. It's actually the same to doff as well, okay? So he's, instead of everything happening in front of him, it's gonna happen behind. So he would reach behind his head for his harness, it would come up over his head, off his good side first, and then he would doff his prosthesis. So that's the donning and doffing method. So coat, everything's gonna happen behind you. Sweater, everything's going to happen in front of you. Traditionally, what we would do is we would teach the patient both methods and then we would let them choose and see what's most convenient or practical for them, okay? So let's get into the pieces and parts because those matter too, right? The first piece is called a stainless steel ring or you might hear a prosthetist call it the cross piece in a harness, okay? The cross piece serves the purpose of allowing the patient to don and doff their harness. These harnesses have to be pretty snug and it all has to do with cable travel and how far that cable has to travel, which again, I'll get to that slide in just a moment, right? But if it didn't have that cross piece, essentially what you would have is a prosthesis that got donned that would never be able to be doffed because it would be too tight. So ladies, here's how I reference that, right? It's that pair of skinny jeans that you have that you're like, oh, I shouldn't put those in the dryer. And then accidentally they go into the dryer and you're going out with your friends on a Friday night and you find them in the dryer and you want to put them on. And you have to lay down on the bed and shimmy in them. And then you have to jump, jump, jump to get them and, and button the button, right? The cross piece prevents that from happening for an amputee patient. So it opens up the total surface area of the harness so that they can six, six, successfully don and doff their harness, okay? Now, that stainless steel ring that you're seeing on the right side is kind of the old school piece, right? Lovingly called the Northwestern ring. The tan piece on the left is called a Baja, okay? Stainless steel ring, not a whole lot of surface area, very hard, very vertical. And now I want you to think about where is that piece going, right? So it's gonna go on their back the textbook answer of where that cross piece should be is C7 non-amputated side. So think about that spinous process that we can all feel, C7, now go toward the, just slightly towards the amputated side, and that's where that cross piece should lie. So if you think about the Northwestern ring, that's not a whole lot of surface area to take up the forces that are gonna be pushed through that 
when the patient opens and closes their terminal device. And so it was slightly uncomfortable, plus, right, it led to pressure on the cervical spine. Well, functionally, what's the issue with that, right? So I want you to think about that location and what the cervical spine does. So over time, what we see in body-powered patients that keep the Northwestern ring is they actually lose neck extension and neck rotation, right? Well, what are the functional implications for that? Think about if the patient's driving themselves and they need to look over their blind spot to clear before changing lanes, potentially that range of motion could be limited because of long-term wear with a body-powered device. And that's how kind of the Baja was created, right? So it is a plastic material rather than a metal material, meaning you can kind of flex it onto itself. Larger surface area, and if you will, as it gets warmer from the body heat, it kind of conforms, if you will, to a patient's body, providing less cervical pressure as the patient uh, operates their body power device. Again, I'm gonna remind you the correct textbook location for that is C7 non-amputated side. And why am I telling you that again? Because it directly relates to how far the cable has to travel in order for the terminal device to open and close. And it will matter. And why will it matter? Because we always tell our patients, don't mess with your harness, right? We try and set the straps so that they're permanent and they can't be messed with. But I'll tell you what happens. As we peek at them through the window when they're walking out to their car in their parking lot after the delivery, they always mess with it. For whatever reason, right, it always ends up more towards midline and directly on their cervical spine. So as a therapist, if you're starting to see that that terminal device is too far past midline when it opens and closes, the cross piece is your problem, okay? So don't let it be scary. You can adjust it, but here's a piece of advice that I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you the same advice that I do to my son when he leaves the house every morning. Son, never forget where you started and don't ever, don't ever forget where home is. Same thing here. Don't ever forget where that cross piece was supposed to start, right? Um, and bring it back to home. Uh, that will help uh, the, the terminal device open at a more appropriate or midline location. The next piece we're gonna talk about is the axle loop, okay? So the axle loop is what actually goes underneath the armpit or in the axilla on the sound side, right? This guy can cause more trouble than what it's worth, okay? There are three things I would like you to keep an eye on as it relates to the axle loop. First and foremost, remember where it's located and remember how snug that harness has to be in order for the patient to appropriately operate their body powered prosthesis. So one of the cardinal things that I always look for or always ask for is, are you having any numbness or tingling? Because if they are, what do they have? Brachial plexus pressure, right? That harness is just too dang tight and they're getting too much pressure. Again, another reason why I said don't be afraid or intimidated to adjust that harness so that you can relieve some of that pressure. If that's something that you feel like you may not be comfortable with, make sure you have your prosthetist on speed dial. You give them a call, you get the patient over there to get an adjustment so we can relieve that pressure, okay? The other thing to keep an eye on with that axle loop is it tends to migrate, right? So this is the more rugged, heavy duty style device. So you're gonna see your patients wearing this in the garage, when they're outside doing their lawn maintenance, or when they're doing something rough and rugged, right? So think about a warm summer day and the patient's using the device just exactly what it was intended for. Well, there is a chance that that axle loop will migrate more anteriorly, right? Or it will just slip and slide a little bit with some sweat. And so what you're always gonna to wanna to check for is skin integrity issues. I tell a story um, that I think had the most impact on my career as it relates to the axle loop in that we had fit a sweet uh, Amish girl who was 16 and I said to mom, I said, hey, please make sure um, initially, and I tell all my patients this, that they've got something, some barrier between their skin and their harness initially, right? Until they kind of get used to the harness, they get more wear time underneath their belt and they kind of, if you will, toughen up that skin. Mom said, yep, yep, sure, no problem. At our one week follow-up, I, I said to our patient, I said, do you mind if I take a peek at your skin? And it was like mom and patient's eyes were like deer in headlights, like, oh, she was gonna check up on this skin. 
So when I happened to look, she had about a 50 cent open area blister right on the anterior portion of her axilla because just exactly what I just explained had happened. She'd been out doing chores in the yard um, and due to some sweat, the axilla loop had gone back and forth and created a bunch of friction. Um, and so it was kind of a sad day when I said, okay, I've got to take the device until, until this clears up um, because they'd already kind of proven, right? They couldn't be trusted to wear something between their harness um, and the patient's skin. So something to be mindful about um, and keep an eye on to make sure we're keeping intact skin integrity. The other thing with an axle loop is right up the OT alley, right? And it goes with an ADL. You wouldn't think you'd have to tell the patient, wash your armpit, but that might be the best piece of advice you're gonna give them if they're a body powered patient is wash your armpit, right? That's a plastic piece of material. It is going to take on whatever odor or scent is present in the armpit and you can't get it off, right? So I learned a lesson a hard way and I will never ride with a body powered device in my car. They always go into the trunk because I get burnt every time on having an axle loop that smells and then it seems like that's all you can smell. So especially too, if a patient is hypervigilant of something like that, that might be your best piece of advice to give to them. So how do these things operate? Right? When I think about a body powered style device, I think about gross movement. So like I previously said, it's going to take the chest, the shoulder or the elbow, if you will, to operate this style of device. Okay. So for a below elbow or transradial, in order to get the terminal device open, it's just humeral flexion. They are going to bring their arm forward. The terminal device is going to open. They're going to bring back into humeral extension and the device is going to close. And we're going to show you that here in Kendall's video. Arm forward, humeral flexion, terminal device opens, humeral extension, terminal device closes. Okay. One thing I do want you to keep in mind of though, is that cable travel, right? That cable has to travel five centimeters or about two inches in order to get enough tension to open the terminal device. So remember how I talked about the location of that cross piece? is super important. Well, that's why it's super important, right? If they move it towards the center of their body, what they're doing is actually creating a greater distance that that cable has to travel in order for the terminal device to actuate or open. And that's where you start to see them passing midline before you see the terminal device react or open or close. And what are the functional implications of that, right? Well, if it's not opening at midline where they complete all their functional tasks, then what they're gonna have to do is do some sort of compensatory motion to shorten that distance. And how do they do that? Well, they abduct and internally rotate their shoulder, right? Onesies, twosies, maybe not a bad thing to modify that cable travel in a in, in different functional envelope, but to have to do that every single time you wanna open or close, that's a recipe for disaster for their shoulder, right? So that's why that cross piece is so important and something just to keep in mind as you're making an adjustment to that harness, okay? In regards to terminal devices or what's gonna replace the patient hand, a body power device and the, and the terminal devices is kind of like looking for a plate guard in the Salmon to Preston catalog, right? So I feel like, mm, my patient needs a plate guard. I'm gonna look it up. And lo and behold, you have four pages of different plate guards, right? You have clear ones, you have metal ones, you have plastic ones, you have pink ones, you have purple ones, right? Any sort of plate guard you can possibly come up with. Well, terminal devices are kind of the exact same way in that, oh, you need a body powered terminal device? Okay, we're gonna open the catalog, right? And there was about three or four different pages of hooks, okay? And they're all sorts of different shapes and styles for the functional tasks that they were intended for. Now, what you will see is a page of hands, right? So I will say traditionally, when we fit a body powered style device, we're going to fit a hook, right? And why is that? Because of the style device that that this device is gonna complete, right? So it's those more rugged, outdoorsy, rough, tough, gruff, exercises than maybe something a hand can do. Additionally, why don't we use a hand more frequently than we do? 
a couple of reasons. So I'm not a physics person. I will tell you physics was also almost the great demise of me being an occupational therapist. But there is a direct correlation about the amount of tension that is present at the shoulder um, to open the terminal device. And that tension to open the hand is significantly more than is a hook. The other reason why you'll see us not use it as much is that the hand is a little bit more oversized. And so the patient would have to use a lot more of visual attention to the terminal device or the hand. Um, and it's hard to see around and see what they're doing. Um, and so we just tend more to, to the hook than we do the hand. Now, that being said, is it a never scenario? No, but I would say it's a infrequently to rare scenario um, that you will see a hand on the end of a body powered device um, versus, versus a hook. And talking about rough and gruff tasks, right? Here it is. So here's a body power, here's a patient using a body powered style device to pick up a water jug, right? So he's got that water jug, you'll see at one point, just solely in the terminal device of his hook. I don't know that a myoelectric device is capable of holding that much weight without some catastrophic failure. So those are some of the tasks or even some of those fine motor tasks of, of managing a circle or a round doorknob rather than a lever arm, okay? So I've talked about a lot of the advantages to a body powered style device. What are the disadvantages? So if I had to say one major disadvantage to the body powered style device, it would be the grip force of this style of device, okay? So the grip force of this style device is created through a rubber band that's placed on the hook, okay? Each rubber band represents about a pound to a pound and a half. And remember how I talked about there is that equation, that physics piece of how much force the shoulder has to produce in order to open the terminal device? That's proportional to how many rubber bands are on the patient's terminal device. So frequently, we only let our patients have about five or six. Now, are there times that they sneak in a few? Absolutely, um, that happens. But I do always feel like I have to advise them that if they get much past six, which is about six pounds-ish, right, at the low end, um, and going to about 10 and a half, 11 pounds at the high end, right, I do have to say that's not, a lot of grip force, especially especially when we're talking about a much younger patient population. But if they get much higher than that, the force they're applying and the risk for injury um, at their shoulder is pretty significant. So if there is a downside to the body powered style device, it is the grip force. Okay. So who would be an ideal candidate for this style of device? This guy. Okay. This is Jeremy. He was ATV versus stop sign in stop sign one. That's how he sustained his amputation. This is his garage, right? It's just like a really big barn where there's all the fa all of his favorite tools and toys, right? So this person or somebody like Jeremy, who's a farmer, is absolutely the most ideal candidate, right? So he uses his chainsaw. You're going to see him weld. I say any patient who spends a majority of their day outside or in their lawn or anything like that, that's the perfect candidate, right? Because the ideal situation is, is we want them in a functioning operational prosthesis and we don't want to see them in the office all the time for, for repairs. So if Jeremy didn't have this style of device as his primary style of device, he probably would be breaking lots of things. So it is a body powered style device that keeps Jeremy operational. We're gonna take a little bit of a switch and we're gonna start talking about myoelectric prosthetic devices, okay? So we will, much like we talked about the body powered style device, we will talk a little bit about the history. Um, again, just because I think it's important to, dis to see uh, where these devices came from. So the first myoelectric prosthesis was actually invented by a single gentleman by the name of Reinhold Ryder, okay? But it was before the transistor was available. So it was a vacuum-based prosthesis, if you will. Meaning, if you weren't at Reinhold's workbench, then I'm so sorry, you couldn't use that prosthesis. 
So remember how we talked about how war advanced technology? Well, that's exactly what happened, right? Technology just progressed. And so the transistor became available. So once it was available, a lot of the big countries came together and they developed what they lovingly called the Kabrinsky prosthesis, okay? So it really wasn't that much different than Reinhold's device other than it wasn't vacuum based. It had the transistor in it, which made it fully portable, meaning you didn't have to stand at Reinhold's workbench to operate this style of device. There are lots of similarities in this first style of device that we still use today. And guess what? There are some advancements in technology that have just made it a better operating device. Okay. So the first thing that stays true is that we utilize a muscle from one group to do one motion and a muscle from another group to do another motion. So again, because we're talking about a transradial or below elbow patient, we're going to use the wrist extensors to open the terminal device and we're going to use the wrist flexors to close the terminal device, right? Now, you're probably thinking, well, wrist extensors, like which wrist, wrist, which, I'll get that out eventually, which wrist extensor is she referring to? I don't know. I don't know if it's the extensor carpi ulnaris or what it is. Y'all, I'm too far, too far removed from anatomy and physiology to tell you that. What I'm talking about is a general location, okay? So you're gonna look at the extensor wad, you're gonna look at the flexor wad, right? And then you're gonna find a motor point on that where you can pick up the best EMG signal. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but that's one thing that still holds true. Another thing that still holds true, it's still fully portable, right? So these devices are traditionally self-suspended um, on a patient's residual limb and they are able to ambulate around with them. Okay. Couple of the downsides or a couple of the things that have changed, all right, is the Kabrinsky prosthesis could not take two signals at the same time, meaning they couldn't, it couldn't take a co-contraction, okay? Which I think is super interesting considering the relationship between the wrist extensors and wrist flexors, right? They have that agonist-antagonist relationship. So no matter how much you intentionally want to make something quiet, you're still gonna get a little bit of excursion, which is still gonna produce a little bit of an electrical signal and still going to be picked up. So I guess they just maybe didn't have the technology um, to, to see two signals at the same time. So I imagine right back in the day when that co-contraction, either when they were trying to switch between flexors or extensors or when they were in that initial training period and they were trying to figure out how to fire the right muscle, I see all these prosthetic devices just spewing fumes, right, as they fry the motherboard because uh, they accidentally produced a co-contraction uh, that the prosthesis couldn't read. So we're able to use it as a switch method now, meaning we use it to switch from hand to wrist. And by wrist in this industry, it really means forearm rotation uh, and then back to hand. So we can use that functionally as a switch now. The other downside to the Kabrinsky prosthesis is there was only one size available for the hand and that was adult male. So meaning you take a really small patient population and you make it even smaller, right? So have we made grounds with that? We sure have, uh, but is it where I'd like to see it? Probably not quite yet, right? So as far as hand size, um, some devices we have a seven and a quarter, seven and three quarters, and eight and a quarter. What do those numbers mean? That's a circumferential measurement around the MCP heads, okay? So that's we, how we determine the hand size. In some other prosthetic devices, we have an extra small, a small, a medium, and a large, right? I'm here to tell you very rarely, even in the male population, do we get to a medium, okay? And here's the downside to that today and why I say we still have some ways to go. So what happens when the new hand is developed is they develop the medium first, okay? The medium or the small first. And why? Because they have the most space to put in what we call the motor or the chassis, okay? So they get that developed first. So the men, unfortunately, ladies, get access to this technology first, right? And then what happens, it takes them about two years, if you will, to shrink it down to size to that extra small so that we have an appropriate hand size for us, for the female population. So again, while I say we've made strides and there's different sizes, um, it's maybe not exactly where we'd want things to be quite yet, okay? 
So in true fashion, how do they get these things on, right? Because as therapists, that's what we're worried about and we really wanna know how to teach them to don. Well, it's a little bit different with a myoelectric prosthesis in that they're going to use what we call a pull sock. So it's that green sock that's on the patient's residual limb, okay? It's made out of a parachute type material and it's pretty slick in nature. So they feed the lanyard strap down into the socket and as they're applying some downward pressure, they'll pull the pull sock out of the pull sock hole, okay? Why do we do this, right? Here's why. The distal end or the terminal device of a myoelectric device is much heavier than that of a body powered style. So if, you've, if, we pushed, if they were to push into the socket, what they would be doing is displacing or moving all of that soft tissue more proximally, okay? Think about what that does to the end of the bone. Essentially what it's doing is exposing that osseous structure or that cut bone. So to be able to carry the weight of that terminal device or anything out in that hand would put quite a bit of pressure on that bony prominence, right? So by using the pull sock, what we do once they've pushed in and they've got that downward pressure and they're pulling that sock out is we're actually pulling that soft tissue down to the distal end and we're covering that cup bone or that osseous structure or bony prominence so they can stand the weight of the terminal device and they can carry some weight at the distal end of their prosthesis. It's kind of a sneaky trick, if you will, okay? In order to doff a prosthesis, one trick I will tell you is if it is a suction suspension, much like the one that Jack has, there will be a valve in it. And they do need to unscrew that valve or let air into the socket to get the device off their residual limb. If it's a super condylar suspension, meaning they have a piece over behind their elbow, we call that a lecranon bar. My favorite tip or trick is to teach them to reach behind, grab the lecranon bar, and kind of pop their elbow out of the socket. So the donning and doffing situation is just slightly different in a myoelectric style device than it is in a body powered style. Okay. So how do these things work? How do you make this thing work? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to establish myocytes right? Myo what? Myocytes. So remember how we talked about the extensor rod and the flexor rod and finding a motor point so we can pick up an EMG signal? That's all a myocyte is, right? It's just a fancy word to say where is the location that we're going to place the surface electrode over to read that EMG signal, okay? That's all it is. Nothing to be scared of, all right? I will tell you, as a myocyte, they do have to have three characteristics, okay? So three. So the first is they need to have enough strength. So we measure this in what we call microvolts, and that goes from zero to 100. As a therapist getting ready to fit a patient, I like to see them somewhere between 30 and 50, okay? And I'll explain why in just a moment. Insurance says they need five, and you're gonna understand again in just a moment why that makes zero sense at all. So our first characteristic is strength. Our second characteristic is endurance. So we need to see can they hit that 30 to 50 mark over reps of 10 and sets of 10, right? And why is endurance important? Because inevitably, here's what's gonna happen, right? An amputee is going to get their myoelectric prosthesis and the day of delivery, for whatever reason, they're going to think that this device is going to operate much like the original equipment and they can just wear it all day without any problems until you remind them the pretty small muscle group that we're using to operate these devices. Okay? That endurance piece is yet another reason why that pre-prosthetic therapy and a connection to an occupational therapist is so valuable in an upper extremity amputee's life, okay? So we have strength, we have endurance, and last we have separation, right? So we did just talk about how the previous style of devices, the Kabrinsky prosthesis, one of those first devices, couldn't understand or read a co-contraction and how devices can today read a co-contraction, right? They can, but I should give you a tip or a trick in that the prosthetic devices, they don't have a frontal lobe. They don't have an executive function, right? So they don't have any problem solving. 
So they can't determine the fact whether or not the patient really wants to use a co-contraction or whether or not their signal separation stinks. And that's that third characteristic is signal separation. So we want to see the extensors go when they're supposed to, and we want to see the flexors go when they're supposed to. And if they're not working, they're supposed to stay pretty quiet and mums the word, okay? So it will all make sense when I show you this video. So here you can see we're testing a congenital transradial patient. We're establishing myocytes. So you'll be able to see the tachometer, if you will, in the background, go up and down as they're making those muscle contractions go. So as we start to see the extensors fire, we wanna see that electrode only work. Or when we see the flexors fire, we wanna see that electrode work. And again, if they're not working, we want, to, we, want to, we want to see it stay quiet. So characteristics, strength, endurance, separation, okay? So couple key factors as an OT to be working on with your patient as they are working towards getting a prosthesis. So we have the appropriate microvolts, right? We have that EMG signal to operate a prosthesis. Now you may say, well, what if they don't have that right away? Does that mean that they're, they're not a candidate? And no, and that's one of the blessings of the myoelectric devices, right? So with a body powered style device, if they don't have that gross motor movement, then they have no way of causing that cable travel. And so they can't operate a prosthetic device, okay? Whereas with a myoelectric device, that is our standard, right? So that's where we like things to be, but if they don't, the blessing to a myoelectric style device is we've got tons of different ways, if you will, to cheat the system so that we can get them into a device much earlier, increasing their functional outcome and decreasing that rate of rejection, okay? So what are one of the ways that we do that? Well, we do that through what we call the brains, all right? Or the microprocessor of the myoelectric prosthesis. So believe it or not, all of these terminal devices or what replaces the hand has a microprocessor in it, right? What does that mean? It means it has a computer that we can program. Well, what does that mean in therapy terms, right? Well, what that means is that computer software program, right? That what's, that's what allows us to create an individualized treatment plan for each patient, right? So their EMG signals aren't gonna be the same across person, people, right? So maybe one person has super strong extensors but super weak flexors, or maybe one person, they're really weak on both, or maybe another person is, they've really tried to get that separation and they're just not getting it done. Well, what the microprocessor or the computer software program allows us to do is it allows us to individualize those EMG signals, right? So much like you would write a different treatment plan for somebody who's maybe recently had a total hip replacement versus somebody who's an acute CVA, that, that's what the computer software program allows us to do is to individualize the patient's care plan so that they're successful in the operation of their prosthesis, all right? So what are some of the cool features of a myoelectric prosthesis? Well, one of them is the wrist rotator. And what does the wrist rotator allow a patient to do? Well, it allows them to pre-position their wrist or forearm, if you will, right? Without any compensatory strategies. So this is where that co-contraction comes into play. So they would co-contract and then they would use the same muscles to open and close as they would to forearm, for as they would, for forearm rotation, right? So their extensors are gonna supinate and their flexors are gonna pronate. So you hear her co-contract and now you see her operate the wrist rotator. And then a simple co-contraction and then she's able to operate her terminal device or open and close again. Another cool feature, although not powered and it's mechanical, is a wrist flexion and extension unit. And why is that important? This video, I think, speaks volumes for it, right? So if a patient doesn't have wrist flexion and extension, well, how are they gonna get to midline if they don't have one of those units? Well, again, they'd have to adduct and internally rotate, right? As we talked about before, good for those onesies, twosies, but not good for a lot of tasks at midline. And what do we do? We do a ton of tasks at midline, 
right? So here you see this patient flex their wrist, grab onto their coat, and be able to zip their coat, keeping their arm in adduction the whole time, therefore reducing the amount of compensatory strategies and protecting that shoulder long term. Also really good, or what we would call the ETDs, really good for some vocational skills. So remember how we talked about with the body powered style device, and if there was a downside to it, it was the grip force. Well, I'm here to tell you one of the upsides to a myoelectric device and a comparable hook is the grip force. So what the body powered style device, why we're talking about somewhere between six and 10 pounds of grip force with a myoelectric ETD or an electric hook, we're gonna get about 26 pounds of instant pressure. So one of the huge advantages to being able to use a myoelectric device functionally is that grip force. And last but not least, we can't forget about the batteries. So again, one of those super cool advancements in technology. So prior to the lithium ion battery, prosthetic users were using a NICAD or an external battery that they would pop out, put on their charger, and then return to their terminal device or to their socket, right? So here's what I say, is that this, my friends, is the reason Old Navy cargo shorts were even invented in the first place, right? A NICAD, NICAD battery was probably only gonna last them a couple of hours. And so they had to have a spot to store all of their extra batteries to get through a work day, right? But thanks to advancements in technology, that lithium ion battery that operates your cell phone now also operates a prosthetic device. So similar properties, right? So they plug in their prosthetic device just like you plug in a cell phone every night. Takes about two, four hours, if you will, to get a full charge. And there's nothing wrong with leaving it on the charger all night. And as a transradial patient, because that's what we're talking about today, depending on how many bells and whistles they have or how many externally powered components they have on their device, a single charge may last them a day and a half to two days without charging. Now, we don't wanna get them into bad habits. And so I do tell them they need to charge every night just to make sure um, that their device is fully charged and operational for them each day as it should be, but, the lithium ion battery does allow them a much larger functional envelope as far as operation without having any battery issues. So there it is, that's the skinny between a myoelectric device and a body power device as a transradio below elbow option. I'm gonna now turn it back to your local team for any questions.